Well, Ashish, hey, congratulations on your film, The Knot. Thank you, Gig. Now, now, could you pronounce the uh, the film in Indian for me? Is it U- Uljan? That's absolutely right, too. You you have a way <laughs> with Indian words, I guess. But yeah, Uljan is the right pronunciation. I I, I try. I, I have a business <laughs> partner who's Indian, so <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I figured there had to be a connection. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so uh, so tell us, uh, where did you get the original idea for the knot from? What what sparked you to ri- write the story? Sure. Uh, so it's actually something very personal. You know, when I was seven years old, um, and uh, I grew up in the city of Lucknow, which is a large North Indian city. And uh, one afternoon, my uh, family was driving. My father was driving us to have lunch with my grandmother. And uh, we were at a traffic crossing and the, uh, the, the traffic light turned green and my father started the car, but you had a scooter just flying in from the other side and it hit, hit our car. Um, within moments, the car was surrounded by people sort of banging, uh, in, uh, banging at our windshield and our windows. And uh, I was just terrified, you know, as a seven year old, I, I was just so scared. And uh, my father said, roll up the windows, don't open the uh, doors. And he stepped out to talk to people. And, and, you know, I was seven. So no one really told us what happened. We were kind of shaken up. But I recollect that they ha- there was some sort of, you know, tension in the family for the next uh, few years, et cetera. But, you know, I was too young to be sort of involved with it. And I think something like that sort of gets seared into your memory, you know, as a child, particularly. And, uh, and it's, it's strange. Many, many years later, I uh, was at Columbia doing my MFA and uh, I started writing a script about it. And uh, just with that image in my mind became the point of departure. And my screenwriting mentor said, he read the first and you know, seems like something personal you shouldn't just give up on it just keep working at it I just continued working at it um, and that's literally how you know one thing led to the other but the idea really germinated from that sort of image uh, of this event from my childhood and then I sort of asked my father after I'd written a few drafts like hey what happened there's there was that accident and he said you know yeah they it took a few years and finally you know he was exonerated because he was on the right but I think it was a period of tension for the family. So I probably felt it palpably as a child, you know. So that's literally where it came from. Wow. That actually sparked. But uh, but the, the most fascinating about your story is, is because you, you used two characters, um, basically in opposite personalities, but you presented sort of like a, a, like a class system, you know, yes. attitudes yeah. towards class systems. Could you yeah. talk about that? Sure. So, uh, you know, one thing that sort of stayed with me from that incident was why were we so scared, you know, and why was everybody so quick to judgment as to what happened? It clearly sort of indicated frictions in the society, you know, in that moment when it was us versus them, or you in the car, middle class, and, and you've hit this person on the scooter. And then over the years, I, 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 I've lived in the U.S. for a long time. And so it's, I have these two homes now, you know, my, my family home in India and I, I have a life here. And but every time I've gone back to India, I think I've got sensitized having lived outside India to things that I can now see, which I can see how people to cope with these disparities when they live in India, you know, might not see. And I think one of the things that's always struck me is that how does a country like ours, you know, uh, how do people who have, you know, like the middle class and the upper middle class, how do they sort of exist in the system when so many don't, you know, and how do they cope up with it? And what I started observing was, you know, these sort of tall uh, gates, uh, walls, how we sort of build these barriers between us and the society. And what's really fascinating to me is the car. You know, the car in a developing country is a very fascinating concept because it's literally this it's sort of metallic bubble you get into to float through the society. You don't want to, you know, sort of interact. And, and when your car strikes something, the door has to open and drama begins. You know, it's almost like this car is this bubble. And, and when the bubble's broken. And so I, I thought 
this became a very interesting metaphor for this idea of division in the society and how when the female protagonist invites this uh, the driver, she's inviting him into their bubble, you know, and now he's in their bubble. And, 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 and the entire movie progresses through the movie, we see each barrier being broken. First, it's the car door being opened, he gets in, then it's the gate being opened, then he and the little girl come into the house, and then finally they all enter. So it's, it's like a progression of these barriers breaking down and ultimately this couple has to confront the consequences of not only what has happened, but uh, a divided society and has to deal with it in that instant. So that was really why I thought it, the, the setup really served to talk about the things that deeply interest me, which is how do we sort of live in a society with increasing divisions, right? And how do we, is, is the answer really just to ignore it or build barriers or is the answer to actually open the barriers and start having a conversation, you know, and, and confrontation about these issues that we have to come to uh, some sort of a, um, uh, sort of at least a discussion, very productive discussion about. No, I, I did find it fascinating because you, you you did not just present the couple's perspectives only because you also pre- presented the perspectives of the lower class. And when they finally got past that wall, they saw an opportunity. And that's and that's what you actually presented in your film. Yeah, yeah. And, and one of the things I also wanted to talk about, if, uh, as, you, as you rightly said, that when they enter, they are acting. But what's interesting is that even in those three people that enter, you know, there's an age difference. It's the driver is older and those two are younger. And you can already see how their attitudes about what is justice are very different. And this is one other thing I wanted to point out, which was that you know, people have often asked me that how does a country like India, which is so sort of divided in, along class lines, along uh, economic lines, uh, uh, all, all these frictions, why does it not move to the violence? You know, people have asked me and that I believe some of it has to do with this sort of the Hindu philosophy of uh, karma, you know, and this belief that older generations had which said your lot in life today is a result of what you did in your past life. And mm-hmm. somehow that becomes a bomb to deal with what you have, you know. But I think that's changing because we are a connected world now. There are 800 million people with iPhone, cell phones in India. They can see how people live elsewhere in the world. And they're demanding, they're saying, no, that's not good enough. This karmic justice is not what I want. I want justice today and right now. And, and so the younger generation is, is no longer willing to sort of just accept things that have maintained this so-called, you know, harmony if you can call it at all that you know and and part of the thing what i wanted to talk about through the film is that if we don't step out if the middle class doesn't take responsibility to deal with these issues then we could be looking at something you know more violent and dark in the future because we we are growing up in a different environment now you know yeah and and that's not a indian issue that's now a worldwide issue that we're actually witnessing um, unfolding before our eyes. Um, I, 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 do, I do like the fact that you created the female protagonist Gita to be more empathetic and, and that uh, there are consequences to that. But could you talk about the male protagonist, um, Shirish, who basically, um, he's, a, he's an entrepreneur and it seems like you know, he's, he's trying to hold on to his um, you know, position and so on, which, which I find it uh, very relatable because I know a lot of a lot of people or a lot of Indians are like that. Yeah. So it's it's great you raise this point because what I want to, even though Shirish comes across as this person who is, you know, sort of reinforcing the class divide and and always very conscious, much more and sort of in fact even lecturing his wife about like, you know, you can't trust everybody and stuff like that. I wanted to show people that it's not just it's not because he's just a man or he's a businessman or whatever. It's because if you see Shirish's journey throughout the film, he himself is suffering from a class divide. You know, the way he's treated by the bureaucrats, the, the way he has to knock on doors and, and they're shut on him. So it's like we become what we live in, you know, in a way we can't. And part of the theme of the movie is that you know, how we live in a larger society will infect our deepest, closest relationships. It seeps in, you can't shut it at the door. And so Shirish's day-to-day life, his worldview 
is built out of his day-to-day experience. And he tells his wife, you do not understand. You know, the world is like that. They, they, there is this, you know, you have to sort of constantly get, you, you do get pushback. And, and, and so that's one element. And, and he represents that. The, the outside world coming in. And then the other thing I wanted to point out, which is a bit lost in translation, you know, and so I think thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk slightly about it is Shirish, the way the setup is, you can clearly see there's kind of almost like a class distinction in their own marriage because he, uh, you know, and a lot of it is delivered through language, but of course that's lost in translation. But Shirish uh, grew up, in studying in government school, he probably came from a much more modest background, but was diligent, met Gita's father and inherited the business and ended up marrying up. And I think that's a burden he carries in a society that's very conscious about class. And so at the party, when the rival businessman just passes an offhand comment saying, well, I must you know, commend your dad for finding himself a good person to inherit his business, that for a society which is very patriarchal, which this is given it's in a smaller town in India, is a very, it's a big jab to the ego of the man that I'm, I actually inherited. In an Indian context, that's a big deal that you inherited your family, your wife's family's business. You know, you're not the one who created it. And so he's constantly battling this issue of trying to prove himself to be worthy of his own wife. And to be worthy of his state, and that's why the bets he's making in business, that's why his constant efforts to protect her and be seen as a provider, to build that house, to try to get that land to build the house, all those are manifestations of his challenges of being a male, you know, caught in that society. And no, I, I, I happen to agree. I've, I've, I've seen this uh, um, quite, quite a bit. Um, could you also talk about the, uh, you know, basically the when he conducts business, he conducts it the old ways compared to the new ways, you know, that because, uh, because I, I, from my understanding, you know, from, from being from Asia myself, you know, that's, that's actually a commonality of a, a business conduction, but as society starts to change, yeah. you know, here in America, we don't, we don't really do favors with one another like that, yeah. you know, um, directly, indirectly, maybe, but not directly anymore. Can you talk about why you wanted to put that in there. Sure. One of the things I wanted to talk about was that I wanted to play with that cliche because it truly is a cliche today in India. Things are changing, albeit while they're changing, they're not really changing. What they're doing is, what I wanted to show was that it's all getting couched in a different way, you know? And, 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 and this is a classic manifestation of the problem when we don't go to the root of the problem, but try to change the optics of it. And that was my sort of in, intent in doing that is that, you know, he he's simple in that way. Like he's like, well, you know, it's all about the money and it's all about bribes, which is sort of something we are so used as you, right, as you being from that culture can understand very quickly. But even in these countries now with sort of the, uh, you know, uh, 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 the global, uh, being under global microscope, so as to say, right, people are more aware the governments feel like they can't be rampant corruption otherwise it's written about we are in a totally connected world everybody in the world knows and you have to deal with everybody in the world however you are just attacking the optics of it it will rear its head in another way you know and so that was the point i was trying to make and 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 even the second officer that he meets you know, he's trying to be honest, but he's like, look, my career is suffering, you know, because I, I try to stick to the rules. And that is so classic. You know, I grew up in a family of government officers and my father always used to tell me that, you know, I'm an honest officer and that is why I will never, I, you have to live within your means because I'm an honest. He, he constantly told that to us as a kid. And I used to wonder, I was like, wow, it's really a burden to carry, to be honest, in this country. What the hell, you know? But that's the way it is. And yeah, those were the things I was trying to bring out. Ashish, um, for, for yourself, uh, growing mostly, uh, growing up here in, uh, in America, I noticed under your filmography, you mainly do a lot of uh, English, uh, you know, um, films or short films in, in self. This, is this your first Indian film? Yes, yes, it is. I, it's, uh, you know, uh, because I've spent so much time here and, you know, I teach here, um, I'm, I'm a professor 
And but but it's interesting to me that I feel like there is something that I can add or bring to the conversation, which is this ability to be someone who's very deeply rooted in Indian culture and being Indian and my family is still there. And I go there all the time. Uh, uh, but at the same time, I can bring an objective view also being American, you know, like having lived out. So I have this, I feel like that's something hopefully I can add to the conversation, which is like someone who understands the nuances of our culture and yet can come back with some objective view and point things out that to people, like even my friends and family who live there is almost they're invisible because they, they can't, it cannot be visible the other way. They just won't be able to live on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and that's, uh, so I, I, I am, constantly writing a lot of stuff uh, which is related to India uh, and even the English stuff I've done here it, it tries to deal with the Indian milieu Indian American milieu um, yeah and I mean for me film as as for everyone is, is a very personal form of expression so I try to you know say something that I have something to say about <laughs> yeah but uh, from my understanding to to con to basically produce and film an English, you know, production is totally different from an Indian production. Could you talk about the adjustment that you actually have to make in, yeah. in that case? Yeah, it's a great question. Great, very perceptive. I was, ve I've been very, very fortunate with this project because of the people I've met. And, you know, what happened was you're absolutely, th this is, it's a miracle I got this done, <laughs> as you can totally understand. And one of the reasons is what happened was that uh, National Film Development Corporation, which is the apex film body in India, uh, organizes a co-production market for all South Asian uh, um, uh, films across, you know, dealing with South Asian topics. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate that I submitted my script for, for Uljhan and it got accepted. And then they give, they accepted about 17 projects. And then they give you a platform to pitch those projects to about 300 global producers, etc. So I got that opportunity, that platform, but it would have been very hard for me to get the financing, get the support to do this in India. And so once I got that, one of the producers, the, the, he's a leading Indian art house producer, Karthike Narayan Singh, who, uh, whose work I had seen in past and admired. He was at the market and I literally went to him with the script and said, you got to read this because I love your work and of all people, I just want to work with you, you know? And he, he's, he's busy. He only works with two, three directors. He said, you know, I'm not working. He was there with one of his films, but I pestered him like a bad housefly, you know? And finally he was like, okay, I'll read the script. You know, you know how you have to hustle in independent film. He yeah. finally read the uh, script and he said, okay, he thought I'd go away and I never did, <laughs> you know? So finally, I think he said, okay, I'll come on board and let's work on it. Without Karthike being involved, there is no way I could have shot in India. I mean, the, I, it would have been a script and it would have remained that. Also, one great thing about Karthike is that he is a, he wants you to make your film. I mean, he's there as a creative sounding board. He was fantastic in development. But once you're going, he's trying to discover your voice and he's not trying to implant. So he's the perfect sort of producing partner one could think of. I had a mentor here, Chris Zala, uh, who helped me right at the start, who's made me believe this can be a movie. He read the script first time. He's himself a successful US filmmaker. And he said, I'm coming on as producer. I want you to make it. He visited, traveled to India. So he understood sort of the relevance of, of the topic we were talking about. It was close to his heart too. So without these people, you know, without my producers and then a couple of them, Pankaj Salwar and Amal Parikh, who financed the film in India as well, Without them, there is no way I could have done it. I mean, it was these people really knew. I mean, they've made films in India. They knew how to get it done in a small budget. And, and you're absolutely right. I, I couldn't have done it myself. So where did you film this in India? Where, where in, specifically? In, in Lucknow, which is my hometown, which is where the story is set, where the initial incident had happened. It's, was, yeah. what, was the house uh, someone that you actually knew? No, it's a great question. It was a nightmare <laughs> to, because as you understand, having seen the film, the, the house is critical because we have to understand why he wants to get out of there, right? And, and we have to understand how it's in the middle of this chaos. 
and it was and lucknow is not a place like la or new york or bollywood like bombay you know in lucknow you don't have films and it's so literally karthike and i were, were walking house door to door ringing doorbells and saying uh, yeah we would like to make a movie and they all were excited and then we were like you'll have to leave your house for 25 days and they were like are you mad why would you know why would i leave my house <laughs> you're like well how will we make the movie they are like you can do it in the other room and we're like no you don't get it so it was uh, we looked for locations for a year and a half it was wow. crazy the amount of work that went into find each location i grew up in lucknow so i really knew lucknow well karthike left lucknow when he was a little kid so for part of his appeal to do the film was coming back home and rediscovering the city where he he grew up but it was a year and a half of door to door knocking and we found this house and finally even this wasn't perfect so my production designers prashant and satish came up with an idea of how we could film it so it seemed like the house that we wanted and it worked out great i mean they were fantastic obviously obviously we have to talk about your actor saloni and vikas could you go ahead and talk about recruiting them and why they were perfect okay so i'm again very fortunate that i got these guys uh, it took us a long time because as you understand uh, bollywood has a very specific kind of filmmaking that was not what we were looking for so it's hard the economics everything's very different vikas actually is a very well known probably one of the most famous dialect coaches in bollywood like he teaches actors how to sort of speak uh, very well known uh, in, in the country but he's and he's he's a he's, he he's he had done some iconic roles in television shows i mean where people recognize him 10 years later you know because so iconic but he's been very selective about doing films per se you know and so when he read the script he called us and uh, karthike had known him earlier he called karthike he said i don't care about the money i want to do this part because i love it and it's challenging so it was fantastic and he was very serious he moved to lucknow for a month before stayed lived in my parents house because he wanted to learn how to speak uh, in, in that language mm. he hired the he the car with him. talking to him about his life and you know really to get, i introduced him to small business people in lucknow you know to see he went spent time with them saw how they worked how, what they had to deal with he went on meetings with them so he really did a lot of work and we were fortunate he took it so personally to to try and do this uh, saloni was someone karthike had worked in the previous film with called sony which had premiered at venice uh, i'd seen her work really liked it and fortunately she was available we again you know i spent a lot of time chatting with her because she's not from lucknow and lucknow again uh, you know ha- is known for its language and and sort of the way people speak even in the country everyone knows the moment you open your mouth they'll say you're from lucknow because it's got a politeness to its language mm. and so i really wanted that to come through so she also agreed to move i got her with people you know she spent time trying to learn how a woman of that class would be in lucknow you know very protected very sort of isolated um so yeah i mean i was just very very happy that i was able to work with them it was a great pleasure well it seems like all the pieces actually fit together for you and um and you're making the premiere at the santa barbara international film festival festival virtually how do, how does it, how do you feel about that well uh you know it's conversations like this really that's a reward for me because it's when someone like you who has seen the movie is knowledgeable and is asking me these questions i always feel a film is only complete when it meets its audience otherwise it's just still incomplete even though it's complete like practically and so it's really to hear your responses and your interest and your questions that make me feel great so that's the opportunity i mean that's all i'd say and i hope people watch it and enjoy it yeah. that is most excellent well ashish i wish that i could have um, met you in person at the santa bar mm-hmm. it's a, it's a beautiful uh, film festival if you ever attended one day okay but uh, but i have one last question for you because obviously you know for the past 12 13 months the, the world has gone crazy yeah. you know with with this pandemic how are you staying sane and creative this entire time i'm assuming Yeah. teaching is keeping you busy <laughs> yeah yeah so i teach film which is fantastic because i work with a lot of young you know undergrads uh, teaching them writing um, as well as uh, production 
that's fantastic but it's been hard for them also kids trying to become filmmakers in this environment very hard trying to guide them work with them and i've been writing you know i, I mean i think one of the greatest things about filmmaking is that the pros part of the filmmaking that takes the longest is getting the script and 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 you can write you know and you know uh, and 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 i've been trying to sort of be productive that way uh, been working hard on writing um, and working on my next project yeah terrific well shish i i look forward to uh, your next project after this um, it's it's a it's a beautiful film it's very relatable and I, i think a lot of people will actually enjoy this film thank you so much kid i really appreciate your time hey not a problem next time all right shish yeah. bye bye